Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. My name is Una Bergmane, and I'm a Latvian historian. I'm also a researcher at the University of Helsinki. And today I will have the honor to moderate this discussion about the history of Finland and Latvia um, and about the history of Finnish and Latvian relations. But just before we launch um, into our discussion about the past, we will have the pleasure and the honor to hear from people who shape Latvian and Finnish relations today. We will first watch a pre-recorded video with greetings from the Foreign Minister of Finland, Pekka Havisto, and then live from Riga, joining us will be Edgar Rinkevich, the Foreign Minister of Latvia. So, without further ado, um, the pre-recorded video with the greetings of the Foreign Minister of Finland, Pekka Havisto. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, today we celebrate 100 years of diplomatic relations between Latvia and Finland. This seminar is a fine occasion to congratulate our countries on this important milestone and commemorate the deep relationship we have had since 1921. This year also marks 30 years from the restoration of full independence of Latvia. The same year, 1991, the Finnish embassy was reopened in Riga. Finland and Latvia have warm bilateral relations. We have had many high-level visits in recent years. President of the Republic, Sauli Niinistö, visited Latvia in November 2018 to celebrate the 100 years of Latvian independence. President Levitz paid visit to Helsinki in summer 2019. I had the pleasure of visiting Riga in August last year to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the peace treaty between Latvia and Soviet Russia. There are also many people-to-people -people exchanges. Finnish visitors 
have found Latvia, the Baltic Sea shores of Jurmala and the fascinating old town of Riga. I am convinced that as soon as the current pandemic allows traveling again, the Finnish tourists will be back in Latvia. When I was last time in Riga, I enjoyed very much the Rosenthal's Museum and the Jugend Museum. And of course, we will follow very closely the ice hockey this spring. This year, Finland is chairing both the Nordic and the Nordic Baltic cooperation, which allows us to look at the regional activities horizontally. Our aim is to build bridges between the agendas. For Finland, the Nordic Baltic region is our closest neighborhood and group of friends. Today, our region is facing various challenges that cannot be tackled alone. Regional unity is a key to success. The current pandemic has forced us to stop and think how to come out of the crisis. A cross-cutting theme for the Nordic Baltic cooperation this year will be the recovery of our economies after the shock caused by the pandemic. We will look at the team through digitalization, innovation and climate policies. The challenges we face also open up new opportunities for accelerating the development of our region towards the goals of competitiveness, sustainability and carbon neutrality. One positive element last year was to ev even if we couldn't meet in a person, there was a rapid increase in direct virtual contacts between the ministers, governments and civil servants. The historians in today's seminar will speak about the contacts between our countries during the past 100 years, our countries and citizens' paths have crossed in various ways. I am glad that also today our countries are very much interlinked, maybe even more than ever. We share similar values and work together towards our goals for our own regional and global benefit. With these words, I wish you all insightful event today. Thank you. Well, that I think was a great summary of Latvian and Finnish relations that we have today. Um, and now joining us from Riga um, is, as I said, the Foreign Minister of Latvia, um, Edgar Sienkiewicz. A very good morning from Riga and I'm very delighted to be with you to celebrate centennial of uh, establishment of diplomatic relations between the Republic of Latvia and the Republic of Finland. Actually, Finland was the first Nordic country back in uh, 1921 on 26th of January that recognized Latvia's independence, the euro. We were countries that were born in very exceptional historic circumstances. Uh, empires were breaking down. Uh, the World War I was about to end, but the desire of nations to get independence and freedom was very strong in Finland, Estonia, in Latvia, in Lithuania. We were fighting for our independence together. We were fighting for the recognition of our nations by other countries uh, together. And uh, I think that uh, if we look back at our joint history that uh, both of our nations had, we see many similarities and we see also some differences. Uh, we were subject of uh, uh, attack by the Soviet Union, uh, military bases in the Baltic States, the Winter War. Uh, there has been uh, 50 years of Soviet occupation of Latvia and we are something Finland never recognized Latvia's incorporation in the Soviet Union, the Euro. Uh, we also re-established our diplomatic relations after the regaining of independence and since that we are like-minded nations. I think that uh, when we look uh, at our current political, economic and cultural ties uh, as the foreign minister, I can express my delight that they are very strong. Uh, 
if you look geographically, Riga is closer to Helsinki than uh, Stockholm is uh, to Helsinki. If you look at uh, economic relations, Pekka already mentioned uh, the great number of tourists pre-pandemic times and I can only join him uh, wishing that uh, when this is over, uh, Latvians are going to visit uh, and catch up uh, with what they have missed in Finland. And also we are very much looking forward to welcome many Finns that uh, have been coming to Latvia, to Riga and that I believe are going to come, but also trade relations. Also, our cooperation in the field of science uh, and technologies. Also, our cooperation uh, within the Nordic Baltic format, uh, within uh, European Union format, within other international organizations has been excellent. And uh, from that point of view, I do believe that if we look at uh, what has been so far achieved, uh, wherever we are talking about uh, a rule of law and values, wherever we are joining forces to assist countries in our neighborhood or to support uh, civil societies uh, in uh, Russia or, or Belarus, whenever we are speaking with the same voice, uh, we share our common history, we share values, and I'm absolutely convinced that we are doing that in the name of our future. I want to wish this uh, seminar uh, or this discussion uh, a success. Being a historian, I know that uh, historians sometimes are prone to get into much to details. Politicians normally love to see the big picture and ignore some details. Uh, so from that point of view, I think that when you are looking back at our common history of 100 years, you also have some ideas how to develop next hundred years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, thank you for finding time to join us today and uh, best of luck with your work in these, in these uh, challenging times that we are facing now. Thank you. So, and now I'm uh, very happy to welcome uh, my colleagues, um, historians from both Finland and uh, Latvia. As I understand, they are right now uh, joining us. Um, so we will have with us today uh, Professor uh, Kari Elenius from the University of Oulu. We will have professors, uh, Professor Rix Jakobsons from the University of Latvia and Professor Walter Scherbinskis from Riga uh, Stradinch uh, University. And we had already a very insightful uh, introduction to our uh, discussion from both uh, ministers. And as uh, our foreign minister highlighted, uh, Latvian and Finnish relations, they date back uh, to, um, to our proclamation of independence, um, the common struggle for independence, uh, both Latvia and Finland had to... Um, face a bloody civil war before they were able to consolidate their independence. They had to fight um, in through diplomatic negotiations um, for the international recognition. Um, and before that, both Latvia and Finland were part of the um, Tsarist Empire. And I see that my colleagues are already here. Welcome. How are you today? Thank you, I'm fine. Um, I already introduced you while you were joining uh, us. Um, maybe as we are waiting for Walters, uh, can you probably explain us why are you interested in the history of Latvian-Finnish relations? Professor Lenius. Thank you very much. Well, there is no any convincing reasons for that. It's just like that. For some reason I cannot explain. I just got interested in the history of Baltic countries in my early 80s when I was a school kid. And I first uh, uh, focused on Estonia, but later on I found that, well, there are other interesting countries as, and people as well, such as Latvia. 
and Lithuania as well. But that's all I can say about that. Mm. No reason. Yeah. yeah, I think that's always the case that we just start to do our research about something that is close to our heart and then then the research just expands further and further. Um, and I say, see, I can't see Professor Jakobsons anymore, um, but I'm sure he will uh, rejoin us in a minute. Uh, Professor Jibinskis, you wrote your doctoral dissertation in Finland. I did my research uh, on uh, Latvian uh, and Finnish relations. I have spent a lot of time uh, doing research both in Finland and in Latvia, and uh, it was exciting time. Those relations are interesting. And I have always thought about uh, what makes uh, those relations interesting for me, because uh, usually this perception of Finland in Latvia is it's quite similar country to Latvia. There is nothing, there are no waterfalls, no, uh, no, no nothing uh, like ex extremely um, exciting. But uh, then I think what, what is important is, uh, are those similarities which could create parallels, uh, how Latvia and how Finland developed and, and how both those countries interacted during the interwar years. Probably we can just very briefly, uh, I can say a couple of words about what is the Euro recognition and what does it mean for a state um, and what it meant for Latvia. The Euro recognition basically means that the international community, the community of states, um, decides that a state which is climbing uh, to for the for the status of an independent state, that this international community decides that yes, the state had met the basic requirements of state statehood, permanent uh, population control over the territory, an effective government, and the capacity to enter relations with other states. But this decision is not just a legal decision, it's not just a formal decision, it's also a very sensitive and political decision uh, that the states um, have to make. Um, and the sensitivity comes from the fact that the rise of a new state, such as, for example, Latvia and Finland, means also very often the collapse or disintegration of another state. Often that state is empire, as it was in the case of the Russian Empire or the Soviet Empire, um, in the late 80s, early 90s. So for Latvia, uh, this uh, decisive day came in 1921, uh, on the 26th of, uh, of, of January, when the victors of the uh, First World War, Japan, Italy, Belgium, France, and the United Kingdom, decided to grant in the Euro recognition to, um, to Latvia and Estonia. Um, and Finland, who had already recognized the Euro Estonia um, before, then granted also the recognition to Latvia. So I see that all of us, we are ready to start our discussion. Um, so then probably, um, without further ado, um, I will have my first question to Professor Olenius, um, and then probably Professor Jakobsons can later join us. Um, so, before the Declaration of Independence, as I already mentioned, both Latvia and Finland were part of the Russian Empire. In 1902, as many of us know, um, a famous Latvian painter, Janis Rosenthals, met a famous Finnish singer, Elie Forsell. They did fall in love, and uh, very soon, a couple of weeks later, Janis Rosenthals was writing to the father of Elie to ask for her hand. The father, he gave his consent, and in the letter that he sent back to Rosenthal's, he wrote, From the very beginning, I was very happy that my Ellie would build a bridge between two small nations that are in the same position vis-à-vis -vis the Tsarist regime that rules over us. Professor Alenius, can you probably highlight the similarities and differences um, in Finnish and Latvian experiences under the Tsarist rule. Thank you. Of course, there are many similarities and, and differences as well. 
Well, perhaps to start with, the first thing to mention is, is, is that the power of the Tsars was unlimited throughout the empire. He was accountable only to God, not to people, high or low. In that sense, the autonomy of the Grand Duchy of Finland was, was limited and depended entirely on the, uh, on the will of the Tsars. If the Tsar wanted to maintain autonomy, then he could do so. But if for some reason he decided that autonomy was not necessary anymore or beneficial for the interest of the empire, he could end it at any moment. The Finns and Latvians were thus basically in the same situation and at the mercy of the monarchs. This is of, it is of course true that, that Charles in practice gave the Finns much more decision power because in most cases it suited their broader plans within the empire. Well, that's the first similarity I, I wish to stress, but perhaps Professor Jacobson has something to add. I can. Can I speak? Okay. Yeah, the situation of so-called Baltic provinces in Russian empire also was specific, not only fin Finland. There were several factors we have to take into account when comparing situation in Latvia and Finland. Yes, uh, the situation uh, of Latvians from the point of view of national statehood was worse, of course, than uh, Finland. <clears throat> uh, I agree completely with, with you that uh, uh, it was also restricted by Tsarist rule and authoritarian regime, but still, uh, it was much better than in Latvia. Uh, still, the differences from the rest of Russian Empire in the Baltic provinces were uh, very significant. Uh, I, I believe we can even speak about <laughs> certain degree, of course, of autonomy still in uh, Baltic provinces also, uh, namely still a different uh, legal system, legal system uh, different from uh, from uh, other Russia, Russian uh, territories, including a different system of self-government, uh, which determined the relations between groups of society in great degree different from the rest of Russian Empire. Um, and it was uh, so, despite of the strong Russification in, uh, at the end of 19th century, from the end of 19th century, in the Latvian and Estonian lands, uh, so in the countryside and the same in the cities, uh, the elites of society still consisted largely from Baltic Germans, while Latvians, uh, and it's important from the uh, from the point of view of comparing with Finland, uh, while Latvians uh, on the eve of uh, Great War, together with Finns and Estonians, I believe were the most educated nations in the Russian Empire, if not counting Germans, of course. <clears throat> but they were very dispersed in Russian Empire territory. Uh, I believe national uh, consci consciousness uh, is comparable uh, in uh, Finland and Latvia, and it is one of the most important points. Uh, of course, uh, Latvians also had the so-called uh, Swedish times in the past, I believe, I, I mean, the 17th, 18th century. Uh, in such a way, on the eve of Great War, from the point of view of the de development of society, Latvians uh, actually were ready for own statehood. It was not post <clears throat> postulated yet, but they were ready. And uh, by this point, uh, from the point of education and national consci consciousness, we can compare Finns and Latvians, for sure. Yeah, thank you. So, so we see the similarities um, in terms of uh, both the situation in the Tsarist Empire, even though Finland has um, the, a larger autonomy than the Baltic provinces, and we see a high uh, level of, uh, of education. Um, shall we move um, to our next question um, for Dr. Shcherbinskis? Um, as I know from my own research that I did a uh, long time ago at the University of Latvia, after the revolution of 1905, there were many Latvians, uh, many revolutionaries who fled to Finland um, some of them sought refuge and safe passage to the West, but others carried on with their revolutionary activities. And then, for example, one of these uh, high-level contacts or important contacts at the time um, is the, 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 the future minister of interior of Latvia, Michaelis Walters, 
who as a revolutionary fled to Finland and then he left for the West. Um, but then at the eve of the First World War, he came back to Finland and he spent the first years of the Great War in Finland. Um, and in 1914, in Latvian press, while living in Finland, he uh, wrote a series of articles. Um, and the title of, the, of this article series were Letters about Finnish culture, in which he um, described the Finnish parliamentary system, praised Finnish uh, democracy, um, because as we explained, uh, there was a, a large autonomy for Finland um, in the terrorist empire. And he said, in that sense, Finland and Finnish parliamentary system as an example um, for Latvia. So Dr. Sherbinskis, can you tell us more uh, about um, the Finnish-Latvian uh, contact relations before the proclamation of independence? Yeah, there were there were a number of uh, contacts because uh, well naturally Finland is quite close to Latvia, and uh, the movement migration between two countries was not very intensive, but still it existed, and particularly uh, when some political upheavals took place in uh, in, in territory of Latvia, uh, some Latvian political activists found refuge in uh, Finland, in the great Grand Duchy of Finland. But uh, the point is, uh, what I would like to stress is that uh, today a lot of uh, historians and observers are tend to overestimate the role of Mitchell's Walters and his Finnish experience. Uh, I wouldn't agree uh, completely with the point that, uh, well, he got the inspiration for Latvian democracy in Finland. No. There are no clear uh, indications. Uh, uh, Mitchell's Walters at that time was quite a marginal figure in Latvian politics. He represent, represented the a uh, minor, small minority group within social democratic movement. He was in exile. Uh, he had limited uh, means to communicate with Latvian society. And his point of view, which is important because he was the very first, uh, as, as far as we know, the very first one who uh, publicly, um, publicly expressed uh, a need for Latvian independence, however, was unheard of for most of Latvians at that time. And when he became Minister of Interior uh, for the first uh, uh, government, Ulmanis government, in, uh, and he was uh, really uh, for some time uh, minister, minister of Interior, uh, we can't see any kind of particular parallels or influences from Finland. So. I would not overestimate uh, the role of uh, Latvian and Finnish contacts in, in this sense. But then another uh, point is that uh, lots of Latvians spent some time in Finland, and definitely there should be something. And uh, my point is that, is that uh, this something was rather an uh, image of Finland, which was kind of... Uh, positive and exemplary for Latvians in many senses, but least of all in politics, mostly in arts, later in sports, etc., but not so, mu not so much in politics. All right, thank you very much. Um, so then we can probably move more towards uh, the, 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 uh, the question at the heart of today's discussion, which is the time of proclamation of independence. So Finland did proclaim uh, its independence in 1917, uh, Latvian in 1918. Um, Finland received international recognition in 1918 already. And as we already mentioned, uh, Latvia had to wait until 1921. Yet both of these countries went through uh, a bloody uh, civil war before they were able to, to establish their statehood and, and, and consolidate their statehood. Um, Professor Olenius, or, pro or probably Professor Jakobson, I haven't, uh, let's start with the, the Latvian case and then we can move towards the, the Finnish situation. Professor Jakobson, could you explain the similarities and the differences at that time in Latvian and Finnish situations? And as your speciality is the, 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 um, uh, the 
the time of the uh, war of liberation in Latvia, probably you can talk a bit more about the military aspects, but if you prefer to talk about diplomacy, then that's also very interesting. Okay. Uh, I have to begin with, with uh, this previous period of time of the Great War. Uh, Great War actually was a time, time period when we can see the, such a differences between uh, Latvians and Finns. Uh, and similarities also, <laughs> the best simula similarity as an example is of course uh, Finnish Jäger battalions fighting with fighting, not literally, but uh, they were staying against one against other on Riga front line uh, with uh, La Latvian riflemen. <laughs> similarity is perfect simply, yes, but of course the uh, difference is uh, Finns uh, were, not <clears throat> were not mobilized to Russian army. Latvians were mobilized in such a huge number uh, and amount that it's much. The number is much higher than written in literature now. I believe the mm, Latvians were about uh, Latvian people from Latvia. I believe, believe uh, I mean not not only Latvians, uh, four hundred thousand, four hundred thousand in Latvian uh, in the Russian army. Sorry, and. Um, uh, percent was one of the higher in Europe at all. If Germany have 20% uh, of uh, in, <coughs> Germans in army, Latvians about 16-17%. Uh, great difference in Russian army, of course, yes. Uh, the uh, loss of population of Latvia about 22 or 25 even percent. Uh, never, never returned many people from Russia. Uh, many perished. Many were killed in battles. Yes, in uh, the Great War and the Russian Civil War. And uh, the Great War front line on Latvian territory was the main reason why proclamation of Latvian state could take place only in November, 1980, while Lithuania, for example, uh, was occupied by German forces from 1915. Uh, it, uh, Lithuanians proclaimed its in the, their independence on February, and Estonia, which was almost not affected by war for at all, also on February 1918. But in reality, they also became uh, independent only on November, after after the end of the war. Uh, after the Republic of Latvia was proclaimed, a two-year long military and political fighting took place uh, to liberate the territory. Uh, of course, I have not time to, to tell you all, all, all the story about Latvian War of Independence, but I will uh, want to say some numbers simply. There were three Latvian governments, National, Soviet, Bolshevik and pro-German. Uh, interests of a new established Republic of Latvia, Soviet Russia and Latvian Bolsheviks. Baltic Germans and Germany, anti-Bolshevik Russia, new and renewed neighboring states, Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, of course, Finland, and even Belarusian People Republic. Latvia was not only uh, centered geographically now, then. Uh, I would say, I would like to say politically also. And um, uh, of course, uh, in, Latvian, uh, in Latvian territory, there were fighting 14 armies, 14. Of course, uh, on different degree, but still Latvian, uh, I, I will try to mention them, Soviet Latvian, pro-German Latvian, Army of Germany. Red Army, units of Baltic Germans, they can be considered a separate army. Armies of Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, Army of White uh, German, uh, Russian Army of Bermont, units of Russian uh, White Army of Udenich, also British and French Navy. <laughs> and we can add to these 14 armies eight more, eight or even more ethnic units in the ranks of these armies. Danish Company of and Finnish battalion, it's important today, in the ranks of Estonian army. Belarusian battalion in Lithuanian army. Uh, unit of General Bulak Balachovich, something like Belarusian and Ukrainian maybe even. French tank company of Polish army with French soldiers in its ranks. Separate, separate Ch Chinese units of Red Army fighting, fighting in Latgala, Eastern Front of uh, Latvia. Yes, also brigade of Red Estonian, Estonian riflemen. Uh, the degree of complicity um, and tight connection between all region nations could be seen also from such an indiv individual case, important for you. In June uh, 1919, into Latvian army uh, entered 17 years old boy, Jan, uh, in our documents, Jan, I believe maybe a little bit different, Koskelainen. Koskelainen, 
Uh, actually, Koskelenin did it after he deserted from the Soviet uh, Latvian army or, or Red Army, and he was killed. A 17 year boy was killed in the battle against German Russian forces in autumn 1919. I believe he was Finnish or at least Finno Ugrish, born, born, born in Petersburg, Petrograd. Yeah? Very symbolic case, very symbolic, but um, since the spring of 1919, missions of Western allies. Uh, also were present in Latvia. Uh, I have not enough time to speak more about this, but uh, I would like to say that uh, until until June until June of 1919, the war in Latvia uh, was very similar to that of, uh, in Finland. Little bit fin uh, this. Um, Civil war, civil war elements were were for sure, and and um, it's one more similarity. Actually, many Latvians were fighting in Finland on the side of Reds. Also, uh, there were we had we had article about Latvian prisoner of wars uh, from a Red side in Finland. Yes, uh, the connections are so tight that. Um, Actually, at all in nineteen in nineteen and twenty century, it's impossible to study history isolated in isolated form. Uh, we we are trying to do sometimes in Latvian history studied uh, so as if our borders are uh, are uh, history looking only in borders of today's Latvia. It's impossible, yeah. And this Koskilainen and is very good illustration for that. Yeah, that, and I think that's a very good, great point about uh, how um, important it is. Even if we are first and foremost interested in our national histories, then even if I think when we want to understand the national history, it's so important to put in a regional context, because then that shows the specificities of our situations and also the similarities uh, between, um, between um, Latvia or Finland and our region. Um, our neighbors also in Estonia and Lithuania and, and Sweden. Uh, Professor Olenius, do you want to add something to this question about the, uh, the Finnish and Latvian experience after the proclamation uh, of independence? Thank you. My colleague already raised many important points, but if I just briefly add something, I would stress the importance of the Finnish autonomy after all, even though I mentioned that we were at the uh, mercy of, of of the Tsars, but anyhow, uh, Finnish autonomy had existed for more than 100 years, and it made Finland look like a semi-independent country even before the First World War. So, fin so it it was much easier, thanks to that imagination or, or perception that existed <clears throat> abroad, for Finland to get recognition for her independence. Finland was, in a sense, it was part of Russia, Russian borderlands. But anyhow, in the eyes of the British or the Germans or the French, for instance, Finland was a specific case. And they were m much more eager to give their recognition to Finland because Finland was almost, uh, it, it had very uh, strong traditional foundations, many, many structures in its, in its society to build new independent country. There were no foreign troops in that uh, extent, as, as in Latvia, for instance, we had our civil war, but it, it was up to 90% all the participants were Finns. There were foreign involvement from Russia, even from Lat some Latvians, from Sweden, Germany and so forth. But in its sense, it was a, a war between Finnish, whites and, and, and Reds. And after that was resolved in May, in May 1918, uh, Finland could much uh, earlier start to build their own uh, independent society. And uh, Finland appeared different, to put it in a nutshell, and that helped a lot. Yeah, and I think that's also a very interesting point when we think about the international relations the importance of perceptions and misperceptions and that the images that uh, society and the state is able to project. Um, because in this decision of the international recognition, this element of the understanding that this territory, this nation is ready for the statehood 
And the perception at the time initially was because of the autonomy uh, that Finland had um, and the image that Finland had abroad, that the, the questioning of Finnish readiness for independence was less intense than in the case of, let's say, Estonia um, or, or Latvia at the time. Um, Dr. Sherbinskis, do you want to add something to what we just discussed about this time just after the the, the, the proclamation of independence? Um, of course, <clears throat> there, there might be a lot of things to add, but uh, both Eriks and Curry already told the main issues, so I wouldn't consider Finnish northern boys, Pohi and Poyat, uh, as a separate army, in no way they were part of Estonian uh, forces. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, but they, they, they didn't care. About, but the point is, those Finns who were present in Latvia, they really didn't care about, well, if we may call them Latvian national aspirations. Both uh, Jäker in, in Riga front, uh, they even didn't know they were, they were fighting against Latvians. Uh, and the same could be said about Pohjan uh, Poyet uh, during the indep independence war. And, uh, and it uh, characterizes this general uh, knowledge and perceptions and mis uh, misperceptions of neighboring countries. And, and I would say the crucial turning point was uh, proclamation of independent states, and then it, it changed dramatically. Yeah, yeah. And then that's, uh, that's I think, a very good transition to our uh, next <laughs> set of questions, which are already about uh, the changes that independence and statehood brought to Latvian Finnish um, Finnish relations. So we have this one very interesting question um, that um, I remember being very interested in when I was a student of Professor Jakobsons at the University of Latvia a long time ago. So in the early 20, uh, in, in early 20s, um, Latvian Foreign Minister Zikrit Anna Merovic uh, was a promoter uh, of this idea of Baltic Entente, so a project of a large regional alliance between Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. Um, and uh, as a student, I remember, I, was, I, I thought that that was a great idea of that time. Um, but then the plan uh, failed. And Professor Jakobson, can you explain us uh, why did this, this project fail? Um, <clears throat> yeah, shortly, of course. Uh, we are speaking about the so-called Baltic Union, not, not Intenta, because with the uh, word Intenta, we understand quite different international structure. I mean, this is very important from the point of today's speaking, uh, today's talks. Uh, the Latvian, Estonian, Lithuanian Treaty of 1934, uh, of purely diplomatic, not military character. Actually, organization had only symbolic significance during the situation of um, uh, end of 30s and 1940s. Actually, the fate of this so-called Entente, real Entente of 1930s, was very spectacular from the point of view of uh, cooperation between Baltic uh, states at all. Uh, actual uh, cooperation was rather symbolic, uh, the same as this Baltic Entente. But of course, Meirovitz, actually, by the way, Holsti also, uh, was a promoter of the idea of a Baltic uh, Union, so-called Entente, of course, we can call uh, also so. Uh, the idea of, of cooperation at the beginning of the 20s. Mayorovic and other leaders of region states, including Kolsti, were striving for union. And from the very beginning of the idea of Baltic Union itself, from 1919, Latvia uh, tried to achieve the unity of uh, three Baltic states, yeah, important, Poland and Finland. Today we know very well that it was, was not possible. And not only because of well-known Lithuanian and Polish conflict, or dispute about uh, about uh, for, for Vilnius. Um, there was one more reason, and even not one only, uh, but one of the main uh, one of the main between these others uh, was Finland's position. Uh, Finland was not hostile to Germany and vice versa. Latvians and Estonians, a little bit less, but still were. Um, uh, the only common problem was Soviet Russia. Uh, political warfare conducted by the Soviet government since 1920s included disinformation, propaganda, deception, uh, diversions, uh, spionage, uh, 
realized by Comintern activists in all Baltic states, Finland, Poland, Romania also. Actually, it was uh, the foreign policy priority of the Soviet Union in the region, Soviet uh, Russia, until 1922. And Finnish politicians uh, simply were afraid that Baltic states would be much more endangered by Soviets than Finland itself. And in the case of aggression of the Soviets against Latvia or Estonia, Finns would uh, have to fight uh, for these countries and endanger itself as well. But after Karelian uprising in Soviet Russia, the Baltic Union idea was abandoned in Finland completely. Uh, Latvians <clears throat> still continued uh, to try tried, tried to, to uh, uh, to dissolve the Lithuanian-Polish uh, dispute. From the Latvian point of view, it was the main obstacle to, for achieving the understanding and unity of regional states. And Latvian diplomats not only tried to maintain good relations with Poland and L Lithuania simultaneously, and it was impossible. Uh, so Latvia simply uh, tried to maneuver for almost 20 years, but also play a role of mediators generally unsuccessfully. Um, uh, last but not least reason, maybe forgotten reason a little bit. Uh, the disagreements uh, between Baltic states, first of all, border disputes and even small armed conflicts, uh, skirmish with Lithuanians on October 1920, discussions on border issues with Estonia and Poland, actually uh, the unity uh, was rather insufficient, actually was impossible. Uh, in um, the first half of 20s, the idea of only three Baltic states union was dominating, but still uh, filed again. The reasons, the political differences, which were aggravated and simply used by Soviet Union and on little lesser degree at the time, Germany. Uh, actually, the Lithuanian is the best, uh, best example because Lithuanians with uh, their so-called horizontal orientation on Moscow or on Berlin or principle, the, my, uh, the enemy of my enemy, enemy Poland, I mean, is my friend. And they tried to use Moscow and Berlin. Actually, Moscow and Berlin tried <laughs> used them, yes. Um, and um, uh, we can, the only, 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 um, only thing we can see uh, that's positive uh, also is military cooperation of Baltic states to some degree, of course. Uh, it was comparatively better, particularly in the case of Latvian, Polish, Estonian, Finnish cooperation in the field of military intelligence services. Uh, they exchanged information about Soviet military activities, etc. But, and this very good example again, uh, connecting Finns with Latvians and, and uh, Estonians and others. Uh, in 1927, it's very symbolic, Latvian um, Eduard Supelinsis, uh, known as Operput, a uh, Soviet spy of Latvian origin, maybe a little better so, uh, deserted to Finland from Russia <clears throat> and opened uh, opened so told about Soviet de deception system, which was used uh, towards Baltic states and F Finns for several years. Uh, it is not, is not known exactly was Oper put a real deserter or continued his mission as a Soviet spy. Still today, we don't know this. But uh, the result of this action was weakening of cooperation of Finnish, Polish, and Baltic state military intelligence, simply because all, so all sides were afraid to trust their partners fully. Uh, it's symbolic, but uh, I would like to say that uh, Baltic Union, taking into account um, interests and um, me methods used by Baltic governments and Finnish and uh, Poles, uh, were impossible at that time. Um, later also, and um, I don't know, maybe today we have to say our governments more <laughs> to, to learn from history. And this uh, example of Baltic Union, later maybe of, from uh, Baltic Entente, is very good to show the, our mistakes, something like it shortly. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, I think that the story is, is also very interesting in the sense that, um, that what were the plans of these newly proclaimed uh, states and their security imaginaries, the idea of how to protect themselves um, against the perceived enemies um, in the East and in the West. And, and, and as I think, as you highlighted, that the, one of the key problems was that these, these security situations were so different that at the end, the plans and these cooperations were incompatible, um, not just because of the, of the Lithuanian-Polish conflict. 
Um, we have uh, some beautiful uh, footage from the visit. Probably we can we will see it in a couple of minutes uh, from the visit of the president, the first president of Latvia, Janis Jaxte, and his visit to Helsinki in 1926. Um, we will see also um, the the in a couple of minutes uh, the the footage of the visit of the Finnish president uh, Lauri uh, Christian Relander and his trip. Uh, to 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 Riga the same year. Here we see uh, President Chakste visiting uh, visiting Finland and arriving um, in in Helsinki. Um, so, Dr. Jabrinskis, uh, can you tell us um, about the Finnish and Latvian bilateral relations in the interwar period? What kind of relations these are, and probably uh, can we also compare Finnish and Latvian? political and societal dynamics uh, during those those 20 years of uh, in the interwar period yeah uh, first of all uh, i think we are uh, cele- well we now celebrating uh, centenary of latvian uh, finnish relations uh, we are uh, two years late because uh, well, uh, official relations between Latvia and Finland started already in late 1919. So this uh, de jure recognition by Finland was considered in Latvia as a mere formality, not kind of like de jure recognition by Paris or London, uh, because Finland was always uh, considered as a very similar country uh, as Latvia is, or as bo- all three Baltic, st- all, all four Baltic states were more or less um, similar, and uh, Finland was considered as such. It was not kind of great achievement uh, to have this the uh, Euro recognition in 1921. It's vice versa. It was actually shame to have the Euro recognition so late. It's not kind of big thing and uh, but but again back to uh, Latvian uh, Finnish relations I would like to just point on on uh, three different uh, periods in, in bilateral relations but also those bilateral relations intermix with geopolitics and, and alliance politics etc the first period is uh, includes uh, the Baltic uh, Baltic uh, States Union. You you discussed before. Eric was uh, talking about uh, this first Entente, the very first uh, uh, search for closer regional cooperation. And I wouldn't agree it was failure. Actually, the latest. Uh, it's not so late. It it was published years ago. The book by Marco Lehti on the Baltic Union. He is uh, writing that this actually was remarkable achievement if we put it into the European context. Even though there were no formal agreements, relations were very close, unusually close for that time of European governments. Uh, and, 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 and I still will uh, consider this first period till mid-20s uh, as a, as a uh, kind of very intense relations between Latvia and Finland. Second was kind of uh, from 25 to 34, something like uh, relations were a bit strained. There were lots of question marks. Which direction Finland is going, uh, going, uh, uh, going to uh, develop her foreign policy, will it be more towards uh, Nordic countries or, or uh, still uh, will stick to Baltic idea, uh, which which will be direction. And uh, then from 1933-34, uh, Latvia started a completely different approach to Finland and it was very well described in the, minute, uh, in the report by a Latvian uh, envoy in, in Helsinki, Schumann, is, who suggested we should end our policy of stretched hand. So you understand that when, when two people meet, one of them is stretching his hand to say hello, and another one is not giving his stretched hand. So there is no kind of nice communication between two people or between two countries. And Schumann is, was suggesting we should end this 
uh, stretched hand policy and, and, and just become more kind of uh, uh, more more distance towards Finns. Finns are not willing to join the Baltic uh, Baltic uh, unity or, or come closer to Baltic states. So we we do not need to deal with that anymore. So let's leave them to the their Swedish friends, <laughs> Swedish uh, Swedish family. So, but um, yeah, and and this uh, this period uh, coincided also with the period of authoritarian regime in Latvia, which was which made Latvia and all three Baltic states quite different politically from uh, from uh, Finland. But again, again, I would not like to overestimate this fact because foreign pol policy in Latvia di didn't change much during those authoritarian years. Uh, Eriks will agree with me. And, uh, and, and in the same time, there were very strong authoritarian tendencies in Finnish society as well. So we can't say the Latvians were really anti-democratic, but Finns are, hallelujah, big Democrats. It's not true. But, but again, there, are, there were formal differences. Indeed, we didn't have democracy, parliament. Uh, Finns uh, preserved their democracy, although there were anti-democratic trends as well. So there were differences. There were commonalities, but in general, during the 30s, those relations between Latvia and Finland, those hopes for, close, uh, for closer relations vanished, disappeared. But, but still, relations were friendly, like, well, neighbors, close neighbors, etc. And, and there was some, I would say, if, if not the Second World War, there would be very, very good potential for for further development of regional cooperation. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Professor Lenius, do you have something to add either about Finnish-Latvian relations between the two world wars or about uh, the trajectories of Finnish and, 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 uh, and Latvian societal, economic, political dynamics in the interwar period? Yes, thank you. Well, while I agree with my, with my colleague, of course, to, to a large extent, I wish to stress a few things. Uh, one thing we should keep in mind that in Finland uh, too, there has always been big differences of opinion uh, regarding how to create our relations with neighboring countries. And for instance, in the early 1920s, when the first Baltic Entente was discussed, we, 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 we can remember that our foreign ministries, foreign ministries of Finland, Estonia, Latvia and Poland already signed an agreement, but the Finnish parliament, the majority of in Finnish parliament did not accept, they, they didn't ratify the agreement, but it was that close. We almost signed the union. And in fact, there is much evidence uh, from the 1920s and 1930s that uh, the highest uh, leadership in Finland was much more cautious than the rest of Finnish political elite, for instance. Leaders of Finnish army uh, or important uh, people in, in many kind of important positions in Finnish administration, not to mention uh, many kind of societies, even ordinary people. There is much evidence about uh, a strong sympathy and strong will to develop our relations with Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and, and Poland as well. And it, does, it didn't exclude the uh, improvement of relations with the Scandinavian countries. But if the people had been asked, we may speculate if the answer had been different. But the highest leadership was very cautious and they found, correct or not, that that the uh, poly, uh, position of our southern neighbors was much more vulnerable than that of Finland. But uh, as a researcher, uh, I'm not quite sure about it. Mm. I, I could argue that point then and even nowadays, although I'm not a politi politician, I'm, I'm a researcher, but uh, on the basis of the professional uh, experience I have in, in history, I would argue that that conclusion that was made in, in, in the early 1920s and, and maybe in 2000 as well. Yeah, 
Thank you yeah, very it's, much. Yeah, it, it, it was, was a really very important point, this uh, diversity of uh, foreign policy concepts in Finnish society. But again, we, we know that Holsti and the surroundings of Holsti were very pro-Baltic, but then again, uh, Mannerheim and uh, Swede, Swedish party conservatives and also radical left were very much against. So just there were lots of political struggles on the Baltic issues in Finland. Do we see a similar debate in Latvia about how to better... No, no. Uh, I wouldn't say, of course, it... Uh, it would be too much to say that everyone was uh, kind of very uh, pro-Finnish and uh, happy of having Finns next to Valka. But uh, it's not true. But uh, uh, well, well, what matters is a decision-making process. And I would say there was consensus within ranks of those, I would say quite few people who made decision during democracy period and also after the coup. And uh, Finland was considered as a as a good partner, well, not very strong, not very kind of very similar like Latvia is, decent, nice country, similar traditions, similar history, uh, and uh, well, unlike Pol the Polish case, Poland there were lots of debates on on Polish on uh, should we become allied with the Poles because social democrats were openly against, but uh, well. Again, summing up, n n there were no, uh, I wouldn't say anybody was against Finland, but uh, probably, well, not everyone was very much very eager to do something to to, to get closer Finland. Unlike in, in different uh, in in cases of different other countries, but Estonia is different story. Of course, we should keep in mind. Baltic countries is one thing, but Estonia, this kindred nation, it's different. It's it's more on a rhetorical level, I would argue. I don't think there is real stuff behind this kindred nations politics, but still, it was very visible in in interwar period, and and it's a different story. We have break. Do do we have? Uh, yes, we, we can uh, have a break. Uh, I think it was scheduled in uh, 20 minutes, but I guess... Oh, in 20 if, minutes, yeah. But if if we can do it also now, if our uh, live stream director is okay with that, um, he will let me know, I guess. Um, but yeah, and we have here these, uh, these, 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 these very interesting images of these two visits, uh, the, the the high highest level visits uh, in both Riga and um, and and Helsinki, and I guess uh, what is interesting here is not only that that we see um, the the high ranking officials, the presidents visiting uh, Riga or, or or Helsinki, but that we also see these cities at that time, and it is um, can is there something, Dr. Shabinskis, to say about um, the trajectories of economic or, or Professor Alenius uh, the, about the economic trajectories, the economic development of these two countries at the time. I, th I think economic economic relations were a sad story. We have do we have problem? Do you hear me? Yeah, uh, it was just uh, Baltic states were competitors. They didn't uh, complement. Uh, they didn't uh, well, kind of substitute different products, but they were competitors. But what is interesting? Uh, uh, well, we should keep in mind, and I guess somebody is listening, probably, what we are talking to, uh, uh, talking about, and uh, we should keep in mind the importance of those visits because Latvia had only three major number one visits uh, at that time. Estonian president, uh, Estonian uh, state order Jakson, uh, Swedish king Gustav, and Relander, and it was completely unusual thing. Nowadays, if Finnish president will come to Latvia, sorry, but I would guess most of the population would notice it. Even at that time, it was completely different. You can see the, the uh, chronicle 
pictures, people are waiting, waving flags, and then visit of Swedish king was even bigger event. But Finnish ke- president's visit was the first one. And there were discussions beforehand uh, in Latvian Ministry of Foreign Affairs on uh, w- should we have this exchange of visits or who is coming first. And uh, they asked uh, ch- uh, state president's chancellery and uh, uh, answer from Johannes Chaks, the president of Latvian state at that time was, sh- should we go there? What's the big thing about relations with Finland? What we are going to dis- discuss there? And then uh, Latvian diplomats uh, still lobbied through this visit. And of course, it was after communication between Riga and Helsinki, it was decided Latvians should come first because Finland is slightly older country than Latvia is. So, but again, uh, these events were of very little, extremely little political significance, but they had certain... um, input into the understand into image of, of, of popularizing neighboring country because they were really the newspapers were full well they were greeting in Finnish and describing Finnish culture and everything but real kind of political value was very little very very little so then in the sense of some sort of more uh, less political but societal societal impact was was uh, yeah Ullmanis you can see Ullmanis uh, Ullmanis here on a, uh, uh, you can easily recognize him and he was really he was a very pragmatic politician in Latvia and uh, he has written very little on on foreign policy but he never mentions really as a significant Finland as a significant partner he focused mostly on Latvia, on uh, Baltic uh, states, uh, meaning Estonia, uh, Lithuania, and Latvia, but not Finland. He was pragmatist. He was not fantas- uh, fantasizing or dreaming about larger regional cooperation. So, and it's a very, very good indication. But he was not against. He was not against Finland or, or whatever. Yeah then probably this dream of this large-scale regional cooperation was dreamt in the early 20s and then later um later this this um uh, there was yeah as you as you all already highlighted that, that this uh smaller regional cooperation between latvia Lithuania, and estonia became uh, the main main object of focus so probably we can have now our uh, five minute uh, break our uh audience while we are uh, having the break will be able to see uh, the, the, the pre-recorded greetings on the occasion of the, uh, the Euro recognition of Latvia that have been sent uh, from uh, Japan and, and France and Great Britain and other countries who uh, on the 26th and recognized uh, the, the, uh, the independence of, of Latvia. So we will all meet in five minutes. Questa ricorrenza è importante nella storia dei nostri paesi e dell'Europa. Cent'anni or sono l'Italia fu tra i primissimi stati a riconoscere l'indipendenza raggiunta dalla Lettonia, un'indipendenza alla cui celebrazione ho avuto l'onore di partecipare durante la mia visita a Riga. Roma ha sempre condiviso l'intento della Lettonia di partecipare pienamente alla vita della comunità internazionale. Abbiamo già allora sviluppato rapporti diplomatici solidi, e proficue interazioni culturali. Decenni più tardi, dopo il recupero della libertà e della sovranità, la stessa amicizia ci ha condotti a darvi il benvenuto in seno all'Alleanza Atlantica e all'Unione Europea. Condividiamo i valori dello Stato di diritto e della democrazia. Crediamo entrambi nei principi del multilateralismo, nel legame tra pace e sicurezza. E questa è l'essenza del comune percorso europeo. Con tali sentimenti, rinnovo al Presidente Levitz alle istituzioni e ai cittadini dell'amica Lettonia i più sinceri auguri della Repubblica Italiana. Il y a aujourd'hui juste 100 ans Aristide Briand, ministre français des Affaires étrangères et président de la conférence des puissances alliées, 
annonçait au chef de la délégation lettonne la reconnaissance pleine et entière de la Lettonie. Notre amitié et notre estime ne se sont jamais démentis, sont toujours aussi fortes entre nos deux pays et elles le sont restées tout au cours de ce siècle si tourmenté. La France s'est toujours tenue à vos côtés, hier comme aujourd'hui, comme allié et ami au sein de la famille européenne. Nous célébrons ce centenaire alors que le monde fait face à un défi sanitaire sans précédent. Nos deux pays agissent ensemble avec nos partenaires européens pour protéger nos populations du virus, relancer nos économies, défendre nos démocraties face à ceux qui cherchent par leurs mensonges à semer le trouble et la désunion. Nous partageons des idéaux, des combats communs, comme j'ai pu le constater lors de ma visite à Riga en 2020. La protection du climat et le développement durable, la transition numérique, le respect de l'état de droit, la sécurité de la région baltique ou encore l'action multilatérale. Ce même jour, il y a 100 ans, en même temps que la Lettonie, mon pays reconnaissait pleinement l'Estonie et un peu plus tard la Lituanie, vos voisins et proches partenaires. Vos trois pays célèbrent aussi cette année le 30e anniversaire de la deuxième indépendance des pays baltes. Je me réjouis donc de la rencontre aujourd'hui même, à Paris, entre nos ministres des Affaires étrangères, marquant l'étroitesse de nos liens, leur force et l'importance de notre coopération en Europe. Je souhaite à tous les Lettons, à toutes les Lettonnes, une heureuse fête et vous assure, aujourd'hui comme il y a un siècle, de l'amitié et de l'estime du peuple français. Vive la Lettonie et vive l'Europe. On this 100th anniversary of Latvia's de jure independence, I want to send my best wishes to all the people of Latvia. And to let you know, while you're celebrating this fantastic occasion, your friends in Britain are celebrating in spirit with you. Because our two nations are not just bound by friendship, but by history. When you fought for freedom in those first weeks and months of your nation's life, our Royal Navy was with you. And it was British warships that stood guard over Latvia's first ever government as it took refuge on the merchant vessel Saratov in the port of Leipaya for three months in early 1990. Today, the 112 UK servicemen who lost their lives in Baltic waters between 1918 and 1919 are commemorated on identical plaques in St. Saviour's Anglican Church in Riga and in Portsmouth Cathedral. Our commitment to peace and security in the Baltic is as rock solid as it was in those early days. And today, as your nation looks to the future, we will continue working with you on the issues that matter to both our countries, defending our freedoms and protecting the values we share. I want to wish everyone in Latvia a very happy centenary. Nihongoku Naikal Solidarjin no Suga Yoshide des. Levitz Daitorio, Latvia Kokumi no Mirasama, Honnen, Wankni to Latvia to no Yuko Hakshu Nain o Mukaru ni Atari, Messi Zio Osai Surgoto no Deki. 嬉しく思います。日本とラトビアの絆は着実に強くなってきました。日本にとってラトビアは自由、民主主義、人権、法の支配といった基本的価値を共有する重要なパートナーです。二国間の貿易、投資関係も年々進化しています。バルト海の物
people of Belgium send their warmest regards to the people of Latvia. The centennial celebration of your official independence is an important landmark, a milestone in a long history of your nation. Belgium is proud to be among the first five countries that recognized Latvian independence. And we continue to defend this position during World War II. On the occasion of your NATO membership in 2004, we showed our solidarity as Belgium by participating in the very first air policing exercise in the Baltic States. And today, we want to reaffirm our shared belief in democratic government, self-determination and European cooperation. Our two countries stand side by side in the defense of the international legal order. And we salute the way Latvia has always played a constructive role on the international stage, especially in the establishment of new international social legislation. Dear friends, this anniversary is an opportunity to renew our friendship, strengthen our bonds, and recommit to our economic, academic, and cultural ties. We will continue to work together to defend the values of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. Welcome back. Uh, while uh, my colleagues are uh, getting back online. Um, so what we just saw, those were, as you saw, the leaders of, um, of five countries. So basically, those were the countries, the Supreme, that were part of the Supreme uh, Council of Allied Powers, Great Britain, France, Italy, Belgium, and Japan, who were the first ones to take this crucial decision uh, to uh, recognize the Eure, um, Latvia and Estonia on the 26th of January 1921. Um, and, and Finland then followed these countries the very same day. So, for example, we saw earlier today the images of celebrations in the streets uh, of Riga. So on those uh, uh, posters that people were carrying around that day, you see uh, that, that Finland is also mentioned uh, as one of the countries that has recognized that day uh, the independence uh, of Latvia. So um, we have uh, some images that I think a footage that we are going to see with young Latvians visiting Finland during the interwar um, period. Um, but basically the question that we are now uh, going to discuss is the question of the end of this peaceful period uh, that Finns and Latvians were enjoying in the interwar period. Um, so we have, um, so this peaceful life came to an end in 1939. Um, so during the winter of 1939-1940, Finland fought against the Soviet Union um, and managed to preserve its independence. Meanwhile, the Baltic states were occupied by the Soviet Union uh, in June 1940. And so Finland and Finnish history is often seen in the Baltic states as some sort of uh, alternative history of what could have happened in the Baltic states if the Soviet aggression was uh, somehow avoided, resisted. Um, so why were the destinies of Latvia and Finland, um, or the Baltic states and Finland, so different in 1939 and 1940? Professor Olenius. Okay. Thank you very much. If I say a few words about the Finnish situation and Finnish way of thinking, but anyhow, well, Walters is back, and so, back so yeah. Walters, welcome back. But <laughs> Una already gave the first floor to me in this second session, so please be patient. I, I will have a, uh, I will say a few words about the Finnish situation in 1939 and 1940. Well, uh, in my mind, that's that's what I think. The main difference between Finland and the Baltic countries, even though Finland was, in a sense, the fourth Baltic country, as, as Molotov himself said that all the four Baltic countries will be incorporated into the Soviet Union. So Finland was among them. But anyhow, the Finns uh, found it different, because during the period of Russification, in the early years of the 20th century, when Finland was still part of the Russian Empire, Finland was Russified, and 
At that time, Finland succeeded in protecting their autonomy because they were so uh, stubborn and they uh, uh, trusted in law and justice. And that was, the, was their historical experience from the late Tsarist time. If we just keep stick, uh, stick, stick on our uh, traditions and our rights and don't give up and don't uh, give any reasons for the opponent to to make unjustifiable uh, uh, things, then then we can just be as we are. And also in the late 1939, most of the Finnish holders of power, power and even ordinary people in Finland thought that the Russians have no right to demand anything from Finland. And if we have the moral support from the Western countries and maybe the Swedes would help us if the uh, things go worse, then if we just keep stubborn and and tell the Russians our arguments and show how we are right in this, so we can succeed in this defensive fight as well. So too many Finns did not believe that Stalin was was very serious in his in, in his plans and, and in fact he, he wanted to occupy Finland as well. But the Finland the Finns did not know that and they thought that uh, the better op option is to resist and wait and hope for the best and before and perhaps Russia will give up. And even they don't. We have a strong army, we are we are so strong and, and we don't need any allies, Estonia, Latvia, Poland and or so forth, or anyone because we are so strong. We have a good army and justice is out in our side and perhaps God is also on our side, so we cannot fail. That's that's in, in short. The way the that's Finns a, think, of, of course, it, it's just the way most Finns thought at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's the, the, the perception of the situation and probably the, the motivating force, the driving force be behind uh, Finnish uh, resistance to the Soviet aggression. Dr. Sherbinsky, what can you tell us uh, about? So the question was uh, about the why were the, the, the destinies of Finland and Latvia so different in 1939, 1940? Yeah, uh, it's uh, difficult to give you very kind of easy, uh, easy answer. It's uh, quite complicated, but uh, uh, Generally, among Latvian historians, it is considered as a this response to the Soviet uh, occupation was so th smooth, uh, was because of authoritarian regime which existed at, at that time in Latvia. So basically, one one person, namely Karl Sulman, is, uh, was uh, making those decisions. But uh, again, it's it's probably it's more complicated. Latvia was more vulnerable geographically and uh, then if we talk about any military concerted military uh, reaction to the uh, steps of aggression from Moscow it was very difficult uh, if we are realistic it was extremely difficult and uh, incomparable to the Finnish case but Finland does not uh, well exist in minds of foreign policy makers at that time as a close and reliable neighbor anymore. Finland declared neutrality and definitely in the eyes of Latvian foreign policy makers drifted away towards Stockholm, uh, so to say, and, uh, and, La and Baltic states declared their neutrality as well. So basically uh, they were, I would say they were ready to surrender, <laughs> but um, uh, general attitude again it's not very easy to um, to uh, well somehow classify the, how, what reactions of pe local people were towards uh, uh, winter war events when Finland uh, uh, well Finland uh, started uh, to just fight back Russians uh, because there was authoritarian regime and no free press but uh, there are lots of indications, there were lots of sympathies towards Finland. Oh, I guess we are <laughs> back online after a small disruption uh, because there was a problem with internet in Helsinki, as I understand. Probably, I hope, not a huge snowstorm or something. Uh, 
Um, so we were discussing the, um, the 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 dark years of of the uh, of the Soviet aggression against uh, Finland and the Baltic states, and I think it was you, Dr. Sherbinsky, you were uh, talking about the perception uh, of Latvian society how the Winter War was perceived in Latvia, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and uh, well. There is discrepancy between uh, popular attitudes and attitudes of political elites. But again, it's, uh, uh, I always uh, remember what uh, professor, when I studied, Professor Stranga always uh, stressed that there was not much uh, left for Baltic states to decide in those crucial years. Uh, well, the best the Baltic leaders could do is just to create some obstacles for uh, occupation. And uh, and it was a very, very difficult position for Ulmanis, for Smetona, for Pets. And uh, again, we, we were discussing uh, similarities and, uh, and uh, differences between Latvia and, and Finland. But basically, if we look at from a global point of view or uh, point of view of security issues, regional security, European security, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact um, made very important and decisive steps towards um, further events, change of events which followed. But um, yeah, definitely, well, attitude towards Finland was positive and it's interesting to know that, for instance, this um, relations between militaries in uh, secret, unofficial relations between Latvian militaries and Finnish army took place during winter war period because uh, de facto Latvia could be considered as an ally of Soviets because Latvia, some historians call it uh, since 1939, Latvia was and both Estonia and Lithuania were protectorates of uh, Moscow. Uh, with the limited possibilities to act on their own. And despite this uh, situation, uh, Latvian army uh, uh, helped Finnish army in fighting uh, Soviets uh, during the Winter War, war uh, just uh, sending uh, classified codes, radio codes to Finland and thus helping to defeat certain uh, army divisions in, in, in the Winter War uh, front. So uh, basically this attitude was, was uh, absolutely uh, sympathetic and positive towards Finland, but uh, reality, political reality uh, dictated different uh, different uh, development of events so but we can speculate what would happen if Latvia resisted and etc etc but I think it's out of out of focus we are focusing right now yeah well definitely we have like different geopolitical situations between Latvia and the Baltic states at the time but also the the internal situation uh, I think in authoritarian regimes the debate about the possible options was rather limited. And as you mentioned, the problem with the press, um, uh, the, the, the censorship in the press and the limited information that the society uh, got about the international situation. But as we move uh, towards the end of our discussion, um, so the, the, the situation, and here probably the paths of, 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 uh, of the Baltic states and Finland, they differ the most. Uh, the Baltic states are occupied first by the Soviet Union, then by the Nazi Germany, and then by the Soviet Union again. And it stays that way until the end uh, of the Cold War, until the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, meanwhile, Finland preserves its independence. But we often hear, uh, when we talk about uh, the Cold War, historians often use this term Finlandization, that nowadays has become something that we we hear also in, in the media when we talk about certain geopolitical situations. Yeah, the Finlandization definitely had negative context in Latvia and uh, in early 90s when, when Baltic states regained their independence, um, Finlandization was considered as a kind of submission 
to certain great power and uh, and and it was a position it surely should be avoided by any means uh, but again the finnish uh, story the tor- story they tell themselves they um, they explain is uh, to certain extent uh, different and it is rather it is not um, so much story of submission than story of survival choosing the lesser evil and uh, preserving uh, most important priorities like independence democracy while just giving up certain uh, fears of uh, decision making uh, to the neighboring aggressor yeah but the finnish situation was really interesting and very difficult and from point of view of latvians as well we lived we grew up and we were born in occupied latvia totalitarian communist state we 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 knew we we can talk this and we can't talk this uh, but the uh, finnish case during finlandization process during this cold war era was somehow comparable because finns uh, self-consciously uh, created cen- censorship uh, in newspapers in t- public uh, speeches everywhere you can't say anything bad about Soviet na- neighbor and etc. So there was a strong influence of uh, Soviet uh, Soviets as well. So it had some impact on, on Finland, but again, uh, sometimes we consider this impact as purely negative, but uh, Finns uh, might argue it was not completely negative, it was just a mean of survival. I would like to add, uh, the Finlandization is international term nowadays international term yes uh international politics and um it's in simply words i i completely agree with walters maybe it's comparable to latvian situation but only in some on some degree latvian was occupied finland was independent state and it's a main issue yes but uh, uh this finlandization is simply the way 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 uh, to survive survive from Finland after the Second World War. It's the main, yes? And uh, uh, them, <laughs> it's it's paradox, but for Finns, uh, for Finnish politics, uh, it is, there were many plus, pluses, yes? And they lost they, these pluses after the restoration, after the collapse of Soviet Union. Good moment for you to, uh, to tell us your uh, take on this question of Finlandization and the situation of Finland uh, during the Cold War. Finlandization is a is a term that defines uh, the situation of a small country who cannot completely resist the will of great, of a greater power. And F- Finland, of course, was was exactly in that position after the Second World War. Even though we were able to achieve a kind of defensive victory in 1944, we were still without no allies and without any real. Uh, opportunity to resist, resist uh, if Stalin or, or the Soviet Union in general uh, like to occupy Finland. We were not. We have to try find uh, try to find ways to survive. And at the beginning, in the late 1940s, 1950s, it was just a Finlandization it was just a game we had to play to. Uh, to have two face, two faces to show outwardly to the Russians that we are their good friends, but there cannot be real friendship between a democratic small country and totalitarian great power who is aggressive against all of its neighbors. Of course, that's the situation, but it, it was a game we had to play. And uh, at the beginning, all the Finns understood what was what was it about, but. Sooner or later, perhaps in the 1970s and early 1980s, at the latest, because this uh, artificial friendship was repeated again and again at schools, in, in, in the Finnish media and so forth, then uh, a great part of ordinary people as well began to believe in that uh, political jargon that was not to be taken seriously at the beginning, but we have evidence of, of that from the 1980s, for instance, 
before the collapse of the communism that at uh, maybe at least half of the Finns or even more believed that well democracy and and, and Russian socialism you know, Soviet system are somehow equal there are just two alternative options and and the Soviet Union even had legal interests in Finland and in the Baltic area and we are sorry for the Balts, the Estonians, Latvians and Lithuanians but well we cannot alter the situation and and we are in a better position and we have to be happy so long as we are able to protect our uh, national sovereignty we can have our Finnish culture and Finnish economy and Finnish way of life but in foreign policy we have to obey the commands of the Soviet Union we don't have any other option so the Finns began to believe in that that it was a wise policy Yeah, and I think that is, well, to a certain extent, that's also the reality of international relations, that the raison d'etat, the state interests of our national state, is the, the, the primary focus. Um, as we are uh, approaching the end of our discussion, uh, I don't know if we have any questions from our uh, viewers. If we do, uh, probably, uh, then um, maybe we can get them from uh, our uh, live stream director uh, while I'm finalizing the discussion about the history and then we can answer the questions if there are any. So as we are approaching um, in our discussion the end of the Cold War, um, we are also approaching the, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union And um, so this is my field of research. I do study uh, the international reactions to the Baltic claims for independence, not specifically uh, Finnish reactions, but I have looked at it in the scope of the, the in the larger scope of my uh, of my research. And basically, what we see in Finland at the time, we see two parallel reactions to the Baltic drive for independence. Uh, we see a very careful approach from the government. And this is what we just saw. This is an earlier event from uh, 1975 when there was the big Helsinki conference uh, Helsing, uh, in, in, uh, in Helsinki, the Conference for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which uh, to a certain extent had long lasting effects also on the Baltic situation because the agreements that were made, Finland was the host of this conference. Um, and the agreements that were made uh, between the East and the West, between all European countries, Canada, uh, the Soviet Union, the United States, uh, the agreements that were made also include, included um, questions of the human rights. Um, and that was the first time when the Soviet Union had officially signed a document committing itself to uh, the respect of the uh, so specifically detailed human rights issues. And at the time, Soviet leadership thought that this is was just a mere formality, which it wouldn't have to be obliged to follow. But as the recent research shows, this was something that became a tool in the hands of the dissidents in the Soviet Union and in the Eastern Bloc. It was an argument that they were able to make um, when they uh, were protesting against the human rights abuses that were taking uh, place in the Soviet Union. But moving back to Finland and, uh, uh, and the late 80s, early 90s, so we, we see these two parallel um, reactions. We see the carefulness, the very careful approach of the Finnish government and to the slowly rising interest and enthusiasm in, uh, in, the, in the Finnish uh, society and the Finnish press. And I have to say that this carefulness is very typical for Western Europe. This carefulness is not that typical uh, for uh, the um, for the um, Nordic Europe. The northern region countries such as Iceland, Denmark, they became uh, more and more uh, persistent in their attempt to advocate for the Baltic independence. Finnish reaction, the governmental reaction, is more typical to the Western European states, such as France, uh, the United Kingdom, West Germany. These countries in principle, and so did Finland, agreed that the Baltic states should become independent, but they were also very careful in their uh, attempts not to destabilize the Soviet Union. There was a fear that if the Baltic states become independent, if they push too quickly for this independence, then uh, the Gorbachev, Gorbachev's power 
would be destabilized, there would be a military coup d'etat in Moscow, there could be refugee crisis, economic crisis, general collapse of the Soviet Union. So, but this uh, governmental carefulness uh, is, um, is, is just not how to say a one-way street. As the research of Heike Rausma, for example, shows, while the government, uh, while Ko Koivisto and the Finnish government were rather careful officially, they did authorize very important politically, um, well, they were careful uh, in terms of the political statements, they did authorize helpful practical initiatives under the heading of cultural exchanges with Estonia. And we see slowly but steadily increasing uh, reconnection between uh, Finland and first Estonia and then the rest of the Baltic states. Um, and of course in this uh, context uh, the, the, uh, the Finnish-Estonian connection is the most important one. But at this time, as we know also, uh, the question of the Baltic states, the future of the Baltic states is very much interlinked. Uh, so the perception both in the Soviet Union and abroad is if one of the Baltic states become independent, all of them will become independent. And if none of them becomes independent, and if not, then, then none of them will be independent at the end. So there is not an idea that only Estonia or only Latvia or only Lithuania could become independent and the two others uh, would remain part of the Soviet Union. So Estonian connections with, with Finland are important also to Latvia and, and, and to Lithuania. And as I said, there is growing interest in the Finnish society um, and in the Finnish press. And we in a, uh, and, and, and there is interest uh, regarding the Baltic way, there is interest regarding all the events uh, taking place in, in, um, in the Baltic states. But probably the most important moment is uh, January 1991, when there is uh, an attempt by the Soviet Union to crush uh, the Baltic independence movements by force. So their force is used against civilians in Vilnius and in Riga in January 1991. And we see a massive, uh, very sympathetic response uh, in the Finnish press. Um, there are, for example, one of the main Finnish newspapers uh, at the time writes, uh, bloodshed in Vilnius is a heavy blow for all those inside and outside the Soviet Union who hoped that the Soviet Union would develop as a democratic state and embrace the norms of European civilization human states do not send tanks against unarmed civilians. So we see this sympathy in the Finnish press. Uh, there are also, in January 1991, there are manifestations in the streets in Helsinki in front of the Soviet embassy, but also uh, in front of the presidential palace protesting against what is perceived as a too passive position of the Finnish, of the Finnish government. Um, and then, of course, when uh, after the failed coup d'etat in Moscow in August 1991, when Yeltsin's Russia recognizes uh, the independence of the Baltic states, Iceland is the first country to recognize the independence of the Baltic states, the re-establishment of the independence of the Baltic states. And then Finland follows very quickly. Finland is among one of the first countries that immediately uh, recognizes the re-establishment of um, Baltic independence. So that was a very brief overview of those uh, eventful years at the end of the Cold War and during the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, I'm not sure if we do have any questions from our audience. Um, at least, ah, I see that no, there are no questions. Well. Let's hope that it's a good sign that we <laughs> explained everything very clearly. Um, well, I would like to thank then uh, my colleagues uh, in Riga and, and in Finland for being here today, for uh, discussing Finnish, um, Finnish uh, Latvian relations. Most of the, discussion, the, the questions discussed were not my time period, so I learned a lot. I think our audience did it too. Um, and then I also want to thank the Embassy of uh, Latvia in Finland for organizing this event, for helping us to keep the discussions going and to keep the human connections at the time when we all had to respect social distancing and traveling restrictions. Uh, big, big thanks to our ambassador, Kristin Nasenietze. Uh, big thanks to Mayra Dobele, 
who is the coordinator of cultural projects uh, at the embassy. And a uh, huge thanks to Jan Stirpitis, uh, who was our live stream director and who made all of this uh, technically possible, uh, despite the, the technical challenges that we had uh, for a small moment. So thank you all. Um, have a very good day. And I hope to see you soon and uh, to continue our discussions uh, and our Finnish Latvian connections. Thank you.